Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Today we have a special talk because the speaker is uh, from USA. She's in USA, sorry. And uh, is Dr. Maria Kasachenko from the University of Colorado. And she will talk about the, re the recent progress in understanding solar flare magnetism using data driven simulations and stati statistical analysis of vector magnetic field. So Maria uh, will be introduced by Jose Carlos del Toro. Please, Jose Carlos. Hello, everyone, and welcome to, to this uh, week's seminar. Uh, uh, today, we, we have Maria Masha Pasajenko uh, with us. Uh, Maria, Maria is, uh, as uh, René told, is currently at CU Boulder. But, uh, uh, She's a, a young, but uh, but uh, with a long expertise uh, uh, acquired uh, during the years. Uh, uh, so a physicist, uh, she graduated in Saint Petersburg University in uh, uh, in mathematics uh, to get a, a master a master in science in in Montana State University, where she also was awarded a PhD. In, in Montana. Uh, Maria Gasajenko uh, joined, joined uh, uh, in, in 2011 the University of California, Berkeley, uh, where uh, she was working with uh, Josh Fisher. And, and then she was an uh, assistant associate um, research physicist position. In in uh, two, 2018, he joined the University of Colorado in the National Solar Observatory as an assistant professor. Uh, she is currently leading the uh, a group, a research group of ten students, postdoctoral fellows, and research scientists. Her her group is specialized in, in her thesis in surface and coronal magnetism of the sun with, it, with an emphasis on solar flare energetics using observations and simulations. She, ha she has been working on topological modeling of the coronal magnetic fields and reconnection in confined and eruptive flares. With uh, some colleagues, she has developed and tested techniques to perform data-driven simulations of coronal magnetic fields and methods to derive electric fields in the photosphere. Well, uh, here, her curriculum is quite, quite impressive and quite uh, um, a, a big, and I don't want to, to, to enter into details, which on the other hand would, would result too, too small to, to take account of all, of all her, her expertise in the field. Today, she's going to, to tell us on on recent advances in using, uh, in understanding solar flare magnetism by using data-driven simulations and statistical analysis. So please, Masha, whenever you want, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Jose Carlos, for such a kind introduction. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to test it. So it's my pleasure to be here. Please confirm that you see my entire screen and you hear me well. Yes, perfectly. Oh, wonderful. Okay, let's start then. Delighted to be here. It's uh, 9.36 in the morning here in Boulder. The weather is nice. It's sunny. <laughs> it's warm. It's spring. And today I'm going to tell you about recent progress in understanding solar flyer magnetism using data-driven simulations and statistical analysis of vector magnetic fields. With launch of Solar Dynamics Observatory with HMI on board 14 years ago, we started observing vector magnetic fields in the photosphere on the regular basis. And here, it's not a cartoon that we see here. We see actual evolution of vector magnetic fields on the surface of the sun as sunspot is emerging, okay? So the question I'm going to ask today, how did these observations change our methods to study flare magnetism and what we have learned? 
Today, I will show you some results from uh, my solar magnetism research group at CU Boulder and NSO. There are many of us listed here, postdocs, research scientists, plus there are some new members listed here. But I'm go we are focused on the solar magnetism broadly from small scale all the way to large scale. But today my talk will be on flares. So I will show you only some examples of flare studies from me. Uh, Rahul Yadav, uh, who is a research scientist working with me. Andrea Fanasiev, another research scientist. And Marcel Corchado Alvelo, who is a graduate student from Puerto Rico working in my group. So let's start talking about science today. I will show you examples of statistical analysis of flare magnetic field properties of these observations from Solar Dynamics Observatory. And some examples will include reconnection fluxes. I'll tell you what are these. Magnetic field changes during flares, dimming fluxes, and also some differences that we found recently between confined and eruptive flares. And all of this will show you that the sun now as we observe it, is more diverse than ever before from the statistical studies. And then the second half of my talk will be focused on data-driven simulations of individual events of 3D magnetic field um, to show you that simulations are more realistic than ever before. And here are some examples of what I will be talking about. So let's then start and dive into solar magnetism. So broadly first, let's talk about what happens with magnetic fields during the flare. Here is a simplified CSHKP or standard flare model. And in this standard flare model, reconnection between two arcade field lines here, reconnect, creating a cusp shaped loop below the reconnection point and a CME above it. And this process converts free magnetic energy into other forms of energy. This model is loved by everyone. Why? Because it explains lots of observations. And these include newly reconnected flare arcade showing here and also here from the observations. Flare ribbons at the foot points of this arcade shown here on this cartoon and also here from Hinode. It explains also coronal dimming. So as the reconnection happens here, we have close field lines here, a CME above it. And then as this whole structure CME expands, we have dimmings at the foot points, which are also nicely explained by this model. So the question is, can these observations suggested by these models, can statistical studies of these observations tell us even more of the details of flare magnetism? And um, during SDO era, there have been so many studies summarizing different magnetic properties of solar flares mentioned in the previous cartoon that to summarize some, some of these findings, we actually wrote a paper uh, two years ago, um, an invited uh, review paper, which summarizes short-term variability with observations from HMI uh, and things we learned about flares. And this is the paper that I lead together with my graduate students, Marcel, and another graduate student, Cole, and a coworker, Brian Welsh. So I highly recommend you to look at this paper because there have been lots of statistical studies that I will just briefly touch on today. And in this paper, we attempted to summarize uh, what we learned from statistical studies with HMI about flare magnetism, what we learned about the reconnection region magnetism from ribbon studies, what we've learned about magnetic field changes during flares from photospheric field measurements, what have we learned about flux rope expansion from coronal dimming studies, and finally, what we have learned about the relationship between coronal mass ejections above and the flare below. Okay, so then let's start talking about statistical studies. One of my favorite flare features are flare ribbons shown here. What are these? These are foot points of newly reconnected field lines. And uh, the reason I love them because they serve as a direct signature of process in so hard to observe reconnection region. If we plot this ribbon as a function of time, on the left, I'm showing you an image. We see the ribbon evolution over a magnetic field. Uh, then we see ribbon evolution as a function of time. And if we integrate this, uh, this um, area, uh, these uh, magnetic fields swept by this area, then we could get the reconnection flux, okay? 
and I'm showing it here. So if we basically just integrate pixel by pixel, uh, uh, magnetic fields within positive and negative polarity, then we find the reconnection flux. So by conservation of flux with above, this amount of flux swept by ribbons actually tells us exactly how much magnetic flux gets reconnected at each uh, point in time. And we get reconnection flux in positive polarity and then reconnection flux in negative polarity. So in this case, we have five, 10 to the 21 Maxwell's in positive polarity. And you see almost the same number in negative polarity, which is great because the two fluxes should match. The amount of flux reconnected in positive polarity should match the negative. But this is an excellent tool that could tell us about how much magnetic flux reconnects in the flare. The other reason I also love ribbons is because they tell us about a bunch of other properties, like, for example, magnetic shear, reconnection sheet dynamics, and field topology. But let's go back to the reconnection flux. How does the reconnection flux affect other flare properties? From the statistical study in 2017, uh, we here we created a first database of reconnection fluxes called RibbonDB. And here is just for comparison, flare peak X-ray flux compared to active region magnetic flux. So you see large active region could have small flares, large flares, but then there is not much relationship between the active region basic size or flux and the flare peak X-ray flux. Now, if we look at the reconnection flux only, the flux swept by ribbons, what we found is that reconnected magnetic flux plotted here defines some player flare properties, including the flare class. So you see a very nice correlation uh, between unsigned reconnection flux and flare size. So that's great. The magnetic, the amount of flux that gets reconnected defines flare energetics, but we found it from the quantitative point of view. Now switching gears to another studies. How do magnetic fields swept by ribbons differ from magnetic fields outside of ribbons? In this study in 2022, uh, we did a simple statistical analysis of magnetic fields, vector magnetic fields within ribbons, active regions, and polarity inversion lines. We used data from SDO uh, and then ribbons. And then we estimated magnetic flux, shear, current density, and net currents within all these areas, active region, polarity inversion line, ribbons. And here is an example of the quantities we look at, vertical magnetic field, and then for... For reference, here is ribbon shown in orange and then polarity inversion line, horizontal magnetic field shown in here with arrows, its potential component and the tool and the observed component, the magnetic shear, which is the angle between the horizontal component as observed and horizontal potential component that allows you to find how much the like a proxy for free magnetic energy, and finally the current density. So we looked at 40 flares of different flare classes to create this new data set called, called Flare MACDB, which is available to the public to quantify all these properties and see how they differ to understand basically what defines these magnetic properties within, this, uh, within these areas and how they differ. There are many res interesting results that we found from this study, but one interesting result I want to cite here is what creates net currents. We know that the vertical current density is unbalanced if we look uh, at individual polarity. So the ratio between direct and uh, reverse current uh, is not equal to one. And so here we try to understand what creates this so-called net current, the ratio between the two. And we found that there is this nice relationship between the shear at the polarity inversion line and this uh, net current. So we basically found that the net current within ribbon is proportional to the mean shear at pill, which is nicely explained by the Ampere's law. Basically, when you integrate uh, your magnetic field along the contour, that it's equal uh, uh, to the net current. But that was a nice way to, to verify that. Uh, and some of these findings are, uh, and most of the, all of these findings are actually described in this paper that came out uh, two years ago. So if you're interested in details, have a look. Another thing I want you to think about and also to learn about, about ribbons is that ribbons, as we now know from uh, high 
spatial resolution observations, ribbons have fine structure. And here is an image from Iris that shows this fine structure. So if we zoom at this area, you see that there's this wiggles, this swirls. And it's funny that Earth magnetotail has similar structure to ribbons called Aurora Borealis. So the question is, can we use ribbons dynamics and structure to infer the properties of the current sheet above. We cannot observe the current sheet above it, but we see ribbons. So the question is, could we use ribbons as proxy? One example of such a study has been performed by a graduate student from my group, Marcel Corchado Albelo, shown here. And in this study, Marcel discovered very interesting features. So he analyzed reconnection flux shown in uh, black, and then he took derivative of it to find the reconnection flux rate, how much magnetic flux gets reconnected at each time, point in time. And so he found is that this reconnection flux rate, they oscillate. So you see they oscillate. So they display periodicity of about three minutes. And he found it for many, for dozens of flare. And he was trying to understand what's really causing this oscillations. He compared these uh, with X-ray emission from Fermi and he found also similar, uh, a similar burst, uh, only with a small time difference. So there is a small time, it's 42 seconds time difference between them. And then below, I'm showing you the soft X-ray emission rate in two channels and it's really also some kind of pro proxy for particle acceleration. And from this analysis for this flare and many others, we basically found that bursts in X-ray emission occur with little delay of 42 seconds from the reconnection rate burst. So the question we're trying to answer here, what is the nature of these bursts in reconnection rates? Could it be the first signature of flux reconnected in individual magnetic islands above it in the current sheet? That's something that we are looking now in more detail, but the details of this study has just come come out in archive and will be published soon in Astrophysical Modern. Now, switching gears to another studies. Can we use magnetic fields in the photosphere to track coronal dynamics? Well, we don't have coronal magnetic fields for many flares, but we could look at a photospheric magnetic field during flares. And that has been done actually by many previous studies, by many case studies. From these studies, we know that during the flare, positive and negative horizontal magnetic fields become stronger. So here's a difference image of BH over time. So the field increases at the polarity inversion line and decreases away from pill. That's the study by Shu Dong San and many other previous studies. Now there have been also statistical studies, for example, by Gordon Petri in 2019, um, another nice study by Castellanos Duran in 2018, uh, where he found that the change in the magnetic field, the line of sign component of it is stronger for stronger flares. So there is a relationship between the two. Now on the paper that came out last year, we for the first time used high cadence data from HMI that observes the sun every, the magnetic fields every, every minute basically. And in this study, we tried to understand pixel by pixel, how this field changes, what are the time scales of these changes? And so how are these time scales defined? And from this study, here is a plot of uh, mean magnetic field change duration at this polarity inversion line versus the flare duration. We found something amazing. The, field ch the, the duration of the field change is almost always 30% of the ghost flare duration. So you see there is this very nice relationship uh, with a very high correlation coefficient. So what does it mean from the physics perspective? Uh, here is a cartoon. Um, of course, in solar physics, we love cartoons. Uh, we'll talk about models later. So from a statistical analysis of flare associated magnetic field changes in the Adava and Kazachenko 2000 paper, we basically suggested the following interpretation of our findings. Uh, we, 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 the magnetic free energy in the corona during the flare decreases. As a result, the field implodes as a balloon. Uh, shown in here. So the reconnection happens and the field starts contracting. So you have loop contraction here. And as a result, implosion of this whole region below. So you have this uh, magnetic field contracting and pushing on the magnetic field below. As a result, you have uh, enhancement of the horizontal magnetic field here and also field becoming more vertical as seen in the observations. 
close to this um, uh, close to the areas away from the player inversion line. Okay, and you could read about all these findings in this paper. Now, switching from uh, flare ribbons to coronal dimmings, the regions of decreased emission observed in flares in EUV and soft X-rays. Why these areas are important for solar magnetism? Well, the reason for that is again coming back to standard flare cartoons. Dimmings are the area are the foot points of expanding of expanding structures. There are core dimmings observed right at the foot points, and then there are secondary dimmings, uh, which correspond to stretching of the overlying arcades. And both of these could give us an idea of what happens with magnetic field during the flare as the CME lifts off. Here is a very nice study, not by my group, but it uses results from our previous study. That's a paper by Karen Desauer, where they compared ribbon reconnection flux with dimming uh, flux, which is the proxy of the, of the flux rope flux. And what they found is that there is this very nice relationship between the two uh, and also the clear distinction in terms of the flare class. For large flares, ribbon reconnection flux is larger, for smaller flares, it's smaller. Why is that? Very important questions. Another study I wanted uh, to cite here, uh, which demonstrate flare and CME feedback, is a comparison. Um, is uh, the comparison of the reconnection flux with the maximum speed of the CME. In this study, Chung Ming Zhu in 2020 analyzed both both slow and fast. Uh, CMEs, and what they found is that the previously discovered relationship between velocity of the CME and reconnection flux only holds for fast CMEs. If you look at slow CMEs showing here, the velocity of the CME does not correlate with reconnection flux at all. Does it mean that for slow CME, it's not the reconnection that fuels the CME acceleration, but something else? And now going uh, from, to another topic, uh, from flares to CMEs, do L flares lead to CME or are there CME free flares? Here is an example of active region 12192 that hosted three X-class flares shown in here. None of these flares, of these X-class flares resulted in CME. These were confined or no CME flares. Are these confined flares frequent on the sun? Yep, they're even more frequent than eruptive flares. And here is a plot showing you the number of eruptive shown in red and confined flares shown in blue during five years, okay? And you see that there are lots of lots of blue ones. So there are lots of confined flares. So what defines whether a flare would erupt or not erupt? It seems that now there is an agreement that there are two factors that play a role here. First is the magnetic non-potentiality of the active region, how non-potential the region is. And second is the strength of the overlying field that doesn't allow the field to erupt and its decay rate with height. These two factors surprisingly seem to work very well. Two years ago, Tim Lee published a very nice paper where they analyzed 106 M-class flares and distinguished them based on this so-called, which I call Lee index which is the relationship, the ratio between the free energy proxy mean twist at polarity inversion line and the overlying flux, the active region flux. And here is a plot of confined and eruptive flares uh, sorted by their Lee index. And you see that confined flares, they lie uh, to the left of the threshold values and eruptive flares above the threshold values occur in small active regions with stronger twisted fields at polarity inversion line and weak overlying fields, okay? So there have been many previous studies uh, that compared how confined flares and eruptive flares different. And in our study that came out just a couple of months ago, uh, we went one step beyond it by inspecting not just magnetic properties of uh, confined and eruptive flares that I've just mentioned to you, but also we looked at thermal properties of confined and eruptive flares. So to compare both confined and eruptive flares, in this study, we assembled a database of flare magnetic and thermal properties for all flares above C5 during six years from 2010 to 2016 within 45 degrees of the solar center. 
So as a result, we ended up with uh, almost 500 flares, 150 eruptive and more 300 confined flares. For magnetic properties, we looked at magnetic flux and reconnection fluxes and also peak reconnection flux rates that nobody looked at. And for thermal properties, we look at peak temperature, emission measure, flare duration. And then for all of these, obviously we had information whether they're eruptive and confined from the previous data set. So as a result, we published this open to the public database called Solar Eruptive DB. And here are our results. There are many, many different plots that you could find in the paper that just came out. But things, I wanted just to show you four plots that are new. So while many things are similar between confined and eruptive events, there are some interesting differences. We find that peak X-ray flux is proportional to the reconnected flux shown in here. Red color shows eruptive flare, blue color shows confined flares. And you see, they're kind of mixed together. So in terms of reconnection flux for strong M-class flares and stronger, they have the same distribution of reconnection flux. But however, when we look at peak X-ray flux, so let's fix the peak X-ray flux and let's look how confined and eruptive flares are different. Here is reconnection flux rate. For fixed peak X-ray flux, we find that reconnection flux rates are very different. Confined flares have higher reconnection flux rates and the opposite is true for uh, eruptive flares. So the rates are higher in confined flares. And the other interesting thing we found is that temperatures are higher in confined flares. So even though confined flares, they stay the sun, they are hotter. Okay, so why is that? So here is uh, an explanation that uh, we suggested. Why confined flares are hotter and faster to reconnect. They have high reconnection rates. So for comparison of flare ribbon areas and field strength, uh, we suggested the following scenarios. Eruptive flares, they have larger ribbons. Reconnection uh, proceeds there slower and higher in the corona where a magnetic field is weaker. In confined flares, which are smaller and more compact, reconnection proceeds faster in more compact current sheets, lower in the corona where a magnetic field is stronger. In, in terms of consequences for, for particle acceleration, as high reconnection rates could lead to more accelerated ions and electrons, larger confined flares could be more efficient in producing ionizing electromagnetic radiation than eruptive flares. Is it, could it be important for exoplanet habitability? More discussion on this could be found in this paper. Okay, so that's enough with statistical studies. They are good to derive general trends of properties that we could measure. However, there are a bunch of things that we're interested in, like such as 3D coronal field structure that we cannot measure directly. And here, where simulations could help us. So now I'm going to talk about simulations and the work that we have done here on the data-driven simulations over the last several years. So now we have different flare models to understand the details of both flare energy storage and release. Here is a general um, distinction of two types of model as I see it. So there are static models uh, or models without memory, such as for example, extrapolations that are independent from one time step uh, to another from each other. And then there are dynamic models or models with memory um, where some magnetic state evolves as a function of time. And an example of such a model are data-driven models. These data-driven models, which are driven by observations, vector observations uh, in the photosphere became very popular since the first paper by Mark Chung and Mark DeRosa in 2012, uh, which is the first paper after SDO started observing vector magnetic fields at the photosphere. Since then, over the last 10 years, there have been many more models so many that now there is a review paper on data-driven modeling by Zhang uh, that you could look at. So current data-driven models of solar corona, they come in two fla flavors, magnetofrictional models that evolve coronal field evolution using induction equation. Here, there is no 
gas, basically no gas pressure, no temperature, nothing. So these are simplified set of equations. And then another set of data-driven equations are full MHD equations that solve full set of equations. Magnetic frictional approach is computationally expensive, but works only for slowly evolving events, so not for flares. Full MHD approach is computationally much more expensive, however, it works for flares. And what makes these simulations data-driven is that they use magnetic field at the photosphere to find photospheric electric field that is then used as a boundary condition uh, at the lower bottom of the domain. So what makes a 3D coronal field a data-driven model? It's the lower boundary condition from vector magnetic fields. And the reason they became popular is because SDO started observing vector magnetic fields uh, at high temporal and spatial resolution. Today, I will show you two examples of data-driven models uh, of me and collaborators. First is a hybrid data-driven simulation published last year in this paper. And the second is full MHD data-driven simulation, so no MF component, uh, published in this paper by Linton et al. Um, also last year. So our goal here is look at emerging active region in both of these cases, 11158, which hosted a large X2 flare to understand how energy was stored and released in this case. And here are the pictures of, collaborate, of my collaborators. So in the first case, we use hybrid approach combining magnetic friction and MHD data-driven simulations. We looked at five days of energy buildup. Again, no thermodynamics for energy buildup since it's a magnetic frictional model. For boundary conditions, we actually use the actual electric fields derived from the magnetic fields from HMI. Uh, and as a result of this five days of driving, field gradually evolved towards a force-free state, building up magnetic energy. Then one and a half hour before the eruption, we sticked. Now we used the output of this step as an initial state for our, our MHD model, and then let it erupt. So here is an example of magnetic, magnetic, three components, velocity, three components, and electric field, uh, electric field vector in the photosphere used for lower boundary conditions over six days. Okay, so you see evolution of your active region, emergence of your sunspot over six days, and then an X class flare occurred somewhere here, okay? So that's our input. That's what makes our simulations data-driven. So for driving, we only use horizontal electric fields shown in here, and here, uh, no, here is the magnetic field. So here is just a comparison of simulations and observations, magnetic fields, um, to show that our simulations are actually data-driven. So even though we use electric fields for driving at the lower domain, the magnetic fields um, that result out from this driving are very similar, okay? So here's a pre-flare magnetic field from the magnetic frictional run. Uh, it's very complex. We find a low-lying sigmoid and a low point here. Here is a top view of this field configuration and comparison with observations. So that's the pre-flare state of our magnetic fields derived from magnetic frictional run. And the reason I'm showing you here, first is that it's incredibly complex. And second, that if you look from the top, there is this general agreement between simulations and observation in terms of field structure here, the sigmoid here. Now we then use this field from MF simulation as an initial state for a more realistic MHD run. And here are hybrid run results for flare run, okay? We're looking at radial velocity, density, twist rate, and radial magnetic fields. So indeed, there is an eruption once you stick this initial state in the MHD, but uh, is it really an eruption? So to figure out, to verify that we have an eruption, we tracked a set of, of points originating close to flux rope to two flux rope here. And we found a dark cavity, dark dense cavity, uh, where a twisted magnetic field is, is sitting that leaves the domain. So indeed it's an eruption. Great. Um, and to validate our model results, so we compare a bunch of different features. And one of them is shown here. We actually compare synthetic ribbons from simulations. You remember the ribbons I talked about statistic I talked about in statistical studies, same ribbons. So we're actually comparing synthetic ribbons uh, from simulations with observed ribbons. 
And we see lots of similarities. And we also compare reconnection fluxes. They show different dynamics, but very similar overall reconnection fluxes. So lots of things that could be learned from this comparison as well. So summarizing the, this first hybrid run, uh, we ran a hybrid data-driven simulation. We validated our run using flare ribbons. We found a sigmoidal looking flux rope lower down here. This flux rope lies below the three denial points. And um, so of course the main question is what's, what's causing the flare? What's causing the flare? In this case, we found that the most likely the flare is triggered by reconnection. And we also find ribbons, cavity shocks forming during an eruption. So that's our first run, hybrid simulation, right? That combines data-driven simulations with magnetofrictional simulations. Now on the second uh, set of simulations, we did a full MHD data-driven simulations. And this simulation was very different because we couldn't drive for five, uh, five days. It's too computationally expensive. So we developed a new set of uh, specification of boundary conditions for horizontal electric field driving that drove the electric field only during a couple of hours to match the vertical magnetic field. And it has been done in this small spherical wedge domain shown in here. So here is a pre-eruption magnetic field um, where color shows you the currents and then the uh, twist. And here is a comparison of synthetic emission in different channels. So synthetic emission 131, 94 channels. So it's basically different temperature and comparison with observations before the flare. And you see some differences and also some similarities. And here is a comparison of um, observed vertical current and simulated vertical current. So indeed, our driving is set up in such a way that the vertical current at the bottom boundary uh, agrees with observations. So what happens during an eruption? Here is a, a movie of an eruption. And what we find here, here is just a snapshot from this, uh, from this movie. Uh, we find the eruption originates in the sigmoid, uh, which is positively twisted. Uh, shown in red color. And the reconnection happens between this positively and negatively twisted uh, overlying uh, structure. As a result, the final structure are the two flux rope, the faster outer flux rope, and then the slower inner flux rope. Now, this looks incredibly complex. Does it have to do anything with observations? Um, again, here is a synthetic emission from this... Um, two shell CME, which we compare with um, observations from stereo. So here, unfortunately, the cadence was quite low to really show the gradual eruption of the structure. However, we had several snapshots. And here are the snapshots of uh, from stereo, which shows the same two shell structure. And here's a synthetic difference image from our simulation. And so you see that there, uh, the, there is the same two shell structure that you see in stereo. Unfortunately, we don't see its dynamics, but the, the structure is there, which is very encouraging and also surprising, given how incredibly complex the model is. So conclusions from this data-driven MHD run two, uh, we performed this uh, simulation of active region where a large flare occurs based on the observed vertical magnetic fields and vertical electric current from SDO, HMI instrument and SDO. From this simulation, we found pre-eruption magnetic field structure close to nonlinear force-free fields in de and development, development of multiple eruptions. We find that the shear twisted field lines show a general good quality of agreement with SDO hot channel images and then there is a flux rope being formed during eruption due to reconnection. The details of the study could be found in this paper. It's a huge uh, team efforts paper by, led by Mark Linton, by C-section for it, for our contribution. And here is a summary of my talk on recent progress in understanding solar flare magnetism using data-driven simulation and statistical studies largely based on vector magnetic fields observations from SDO. So what have we learned from these studies? We have learned that magnetic fields measurements plus ribbon emission 
uh, observations reflect reconnection properties that we could study in high detail. We find we find that magnetic field measurements combined with dimming observations reflect details of flux rope uh, formation properties and also the CME flare evolution. We find that magnetic field measurements allow us to understand confined and eruptive flare properties in uh, much higher detail than before. And finally, it's the first time probably in solar physics history where we have had high enough uh, quality observations in both in terms of temporal resolution and spatial resolution to be able to, to, to run data-driven, not data-inspired, but data-driven simulations of actual um, solar active regions, allowing us to peek into more realistic 3D structure of magnetic field to understand what's causing the flares and what happens during the flare. But this is just the beginning of our studies of flare and solar magnetism. SDO is just the beginning. I'm sure that we will learn more and more very interesting and fascinating things about flag magnetism, both from multi-vantage point observations from solar orbiter uh, and high-resolution multi-height studies from ground-based telescopes, such as DKS and European Solar Telescope. So it's very exciting to be a solar physicist this day. I thank you very I thank you very much for inviting me to be able to give this talk and thank you so much for staying so late uh, and listening to me. If you have any questions, I should have told it in the very beginning. Please type this question in chat or there are no stupid questions. All questions are great. Maybe I didn't explain something well. So feel free to ask your questions via chat or just by emailing me directly directly. And um, also, I come frequently to Spain, so I'll be glad to collaborate and uh, talk to you. Thank you. Time for questions. Thank you very much, Maria. <clears throat> so now, Jose Carlos Thank you very much. will manage the questions. Jose Carlos. OK, thank, thank you very much uh, for, for a very illustrative uh, talk. Uh, I, I myself have learned quite a lot, and and I'm happy, I'm happy to have a few a few questions. But uh, there's already a hand raised by Luis, so please, Luis, go ahead. Um, thank you very much, Maria, for for this excellent talk. Uh, it's really impressive what you do, uh, both from the statistical uh, point of view, but also from the simulations and. Uh, and data-driven simulations. And I have a question um, uh, concerning uh, uh, these simulations, because you drive them using uh, photospheric data, right? Essentially electric currents, uh, horizontal electric currents, right? No, no, um, horizontal electric fields to constrain vertical electric currents. Ah, exactly. Uh, so my question is, um, well, the reconnection occurs higher up in the atmosphere, and uh, so, in a way, you have to extrapolate the uh, the uh, magnetic fielding and uh, electric field information from the photosphere to uh, to those uh, heights. And my question is, if we were able to measure magnetic fields in the chromosphere, not in the photosphere, in the chromosphere, how how would that help uh, the simulations? Do you think they would? Uh, be more precise or more uh, accurate. The the agreement or or the comparison with the current observations is really amazing. What you can do using photospheric data, but uh, is there room for improvement? I think I think from the from the theoretical point of view, it would be much more useful to have measurements in the chromosphere, right? Uh, that's for sure. Uh, it, to me, it's surprising that you find lots so much agreement based on the photospheric driving. The reason why we're doing photospheric driving because that's all that's all that we have for now. We don't have uh, high quality in terms of cadence. Yeah, in terms of cadence, primarily measurements in the chromosphere. For sure, there is so much room for development. The only reason why we do it in the photosphere is because that's all we have for now. Yeah. But um, yeah, I hope this will be possible with Dickies and maybe uh, EST in the future. 
Yes, so, absolutely. Yeah, so we have lots of plans of doing that. Yes, let's uh, stay in touch <laughs> uh, to figure out <laughs> how to make it work. Yes, but uh, yeah, I have several people working on DK's data. It's all work in progress for now. That's why I, didn't, I haven't shown it yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Gregory. Uh, yes, thank you for uh, uh, Masha. Yes, yeah, really, really nice, nice talk and just a lot of a lot of uh, useful, interesting information. Uh, I have a question about uh, the data-driven modeling and comparison with observation. I think that we have discussed at some point uh, possible comparison between uh, evolution of magnetic field in the corona in your data-driven model and our observations of evolving coronal magnetic field in flares, uh, September 10 in particular, derived from, uh, from microwave imaging spectroscopy data, where we detected uh, impressive variation of magnetic field and in particular decay of the magnetic field in the flare cusp region. So I'm just wondering, uh, do you, did you make a, any comparison with that, like quantitative comparison? Or oh, it's on your list. Of what what is the status basically? Of I, I think um, it will be extremely useful to do such kind of a study. We haven't done it yet. Mm -hmm. There are some practical uh, reasons why we haven't done it yet. One reason is that for data driven simulation, we have to have good quality photospheric data set, right? And we could observe with HMI field evolving up to fifty degrees from the central meridial, mm -hmm. right? Now, for comparison on the limb, we need to drive it somehow from 50 degrees to 90 degrees. We either say that it doesn't change and just pretend it doesn't change and compare it on the limb, or we use multi-vantage point observations from, um, from a solar orbiter. Uh, we, it would be nice to have some, some kind of proxy for how field evolves from solar orbiter, right? Um, we haven't done it yet. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, basically, I, I was thinking just from general perspective. If you have a good simulation of eruptive flares and you have well-defined uh, uh, cusp region, uh, okay. just to investigate trends in time, and is there any similarity at all between these two? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Issues. So the main so... constraint is multi-vantage point observations. Yeah. A good event, mm -hmm. and also ideally some constraint from solar orbiter or some other yeah. instruments. We have some proposals with Dikas to do that. Yeah, let's just do it. <laughs> For, to okay. Define events and do it. Yeah, it would be nice international collaboration also with a solar orbiter team if they could contribute there. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, no more uh, raise hands, so, so it's my turn. <laughs> So uh, my, my my first question was exactly the same as Luis. <laughs> so so I uh, I've already been answered. But and the, the the remaining questions are related with the uh, um, techniques themselves you you use. It's quite amazing uh, how well how well simulations and and statistical analysis compare and and, uh, and how qualitatively fit. To each other. However, however, I'm, uh, I wonder, I wonder uh, uh, which are which are on the one hand the assumptions you are using to to reach uh, your uh, uh, indirectly derived quantities, for instance, the reconnection flux. Which are the assumptions you are using to derive the reconnection flux from from direct measurements? Which are not directly related to to the reconnection itself, which is being produced at higher levels than the measurements themselves. And in, on the other hand, uh, uh, when you are uh, giving giving for granted that corona magnetic field is uh, uh, decreasing uh, from from top to bottom in the in the atmosphere. Uh, this may not be true in a discreetly uh, uh, confined corona where uh, uh, matter is is confined to uh, uh, discrete uh, flux lines. So 
can you can you explain this a little bit and just uh, uh, in the end how accurate are the derivations of the electric field i mean uh, uh, when i was young <laughs> so quite a long time ago uh when, when we were concerned about the the fate of of, uh, of the magnetic flux at the border of the of the penumbra uh, uh, when we concluded that the, the flux is indeed diving down uh, to the surface, uh, we were a bit concerned because uh, our calcul calculations cannot secure divergence of B equals zero from the from the measurements. Okay, I still I still remember I still remember asking the, the great Jack Thomas about that, and and his answer was A, who was told you that divergence of B should be zero. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so in, uh, no, the, 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 point, the point is, the point is, if my uh, spatial resolution is not enough, as for my derivatives uh, 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 to be precise enough, how my uh, inferences of the electric field are good enough for comparing to observations, et cetera. Okay. Yep, that's an excellent point. So let's start from, from the last point, yes. Yes, so our electric field inversion method is based on induction equation. Curl of E mm -hmm. is equal to the BDT, right? So the sun doesn't yeah. care about uh, neither our spatial resolution near our time step, right? Sure. So it's a, hu it's a huge, uh, yeah, hu huge problem there. Uh, the way how we're trying to address it is by using simulations and trying to understand first how inductive our equations are uh, on the sun uh, from the observational point of view. And also, yeah, simply, can we apply this method to the simulations to get the same results? We have done lots of testing work there, uh, which has been published. Some of them show great uh, agreements. The latest work that uh, Dennis Tillipman, my graduate student, is leading is done with Muram simulations. And there we find that um, depending on the scale that you are looking at, the sun sometimes is not even inductive because there are diffusion scales that. So there, there might be lots of problems with that, yes. Um, and uh, it's uh, important to understand what's really going on. In fact, we have the whole EC team that I'm leading with Benoit Tremblay starting this May which focuses on this particular problem. How can we use simulated data to retrieve electric fields in a truthful way and then apply this to actual observations to see what we get in the quiet sun primarily. Yeah, so very important. Lots of work to be done. Yeah, and we're working in this direction, I would say. But um, yeah, it's a can of worms. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. The thing is that the thing is that I mean it's encouraging that at least that the electric field, uh, large scale electric field that we're using in the um, in the active region, seems to lead to coronal evolution of active region that we observe. But we've done it for a couple of active regions, and it's all very new work. So the question is, where does will this work lead us in terms of understanding what's going on in the flare? We'll see. Ya. If you have any thoughts, ideas, yeah, sure. I'm glad to hear that. And regarding your first point regarding reconnection fluxes, so reconnection flux, reconnection flux is basically the flux uh, swept by your ribbons. Okay, so so here we're using the assumption that uh, basically if it's a flux, if it's a structure, if it's a coronal arcade, then the flux should get conserved. So the same amount of flux that gets reconnected high above should go all the way down to the chromosphere. Now, is it true or not? The encouraging fact is that the flux swept by positive polarity very frequently and most of the time matches the magnetic flux swept by negative polarity. And these are, you know, magnetic fields is one thing, but then the ribbons is that's EUV emission. So these ob observations are different. And yet, when we combine them, the positive polarity seems to match the negative polarity. And then in the reconnection flux rates that Marcel did, you, you remember the reconnection flux rates, 
they also seem to match each other. So, which is great. So that's, that means that we could uh, try to do science with that. Okay. okay. Thank you for your excellent questions. Other questions? Thank you. I see Hannah Hello. is here. Hannah is great magnetic person. Hannah. I'm sure lots of questions. <laughs> yeah, Hannah, Hannah is a uh, very good. <laughs> Question yeah. producer. Uh, do you have any critical remarks? Any yeah, any thoughts? Yeah. I'll be glad to hear these. So Hannah, don't you have any no, tricky questions? Not really. oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> or uh, Simi, David. Well, is this is not the case? Yeah. I, I just want to note that we have uh, lately also published, just pub a couple of months ago, we published a paper on the quiet sun uh, estimates of the pointing fluxes using IMAX data provided to us by Valentin mm. from the sun by first mm. sunrise flight. I haven't shown it here since it's on the quiet sun pointing fluxes, but um, we we did some analysis both on the observational side and also on the on the simulations to understand how much pointing flux you might observe at different tau levels. So I thought it was a, an interesting paper. So just Great. putting the words, it's uh, written by a grad student. Okay, okay. so uh, I, I think there's only remain to, to thank you very much for, for, for an excellent talk. And uh, just to, to wish that uh, this uh, is the, the the, the starting of the starting point of a uh, of, uh, of discussion and collaboration in the future between your your team and, and ours, uh, we should somehow somehow convert in, in in finding finding common topics and and sure uh, we are going to collaborate with uh, both uh, ground based and <clears throat> and space borne telescopes. So uh, uh, as you have left uh, your your coordinates in in, uh, in your in your uh, presentation, then uh, questions that may arrive uh, offline can be directly uh, asked to you by 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 any method. So thank you very much again, Masha. My pleasure. And thank you. We'll keep in touch. Yep. Yeah. We'll keep in touch. And see okay. some of you in the clips. Mm -hmm. Bye. Okay.